Greetings, petrol heads. Welcome to our deep dive into the 1955 Formula One World Championship, a season packed with speed, rivalry, and a whole lot of roaring engines. In a year where drivers seemed to have nerves of steel and cars barely knew the meaning of safety, the action was as intense as ever. But let's be real, 1955 wasn't all about champagne and checkered flags. This was a season of highs, lows, and some truly hair-raising moments that made you wonder, how on earth did they survive that? So buckle up as we take a wild ride through the year where legends battled, rules were bent or completely ignored, and history was made. In 1955, the technical regulations of the Formula One World Championship remained unchanged from the previous year. Cars powered by two and a half liter, naturally aspirated engines continued to compete in the Grand Prix, providing teams a familiar foundation to build upon. The scoring system also stayed consistent, rewarding the top five finishers with points distributed as follows. Eight for first place, six for second, four for third, three for fourth, and two for fifth. Additionally, one point was awarded for the fastest lap in each race, adding an extra incentive for drivers to push to the limit. A notable feature of the season was that drivers from the same team were allowed to share cars during the race. In such instances, points would be divided among them making teamwork and strategy just as important as individual performance. Last season saw the triumphant return of the Silver Arrows to the world of Grand Prix racing after a 15-year hiatus. Mercedes didn't waste any time reasserting their technical dominance, securing a stunning 1-2 finish in their debut race at the French Grand Prix. They went on to claim victory in four Grand Prix, ultimately delivering Juan Manuel Fangio his second world championship title. Their success wasn't just about raw speed. The Mercedes W196, which made its mark on the world championship, came in two distinct configurations an open-wheeled version, and a streamlined body variant, tailored for different circuit demands. For the 1955 season, Mercedes decided to continue using the W196, but the engineers back in Germany didn't rest on their laurels. They made subtle, yet impactful improvements, bumping up engine power to an impressive 290 horsepower. With a finely tuned machine at their disposal, the team lined up with familiar faces, Juan Manuel Fanjo, Carl Kling and Hans Hermann, but with an exciting new addition, the talented Englishman Sterling Moss. This lineup promised to make Mercedes not just a force to be reckoned with, but the team everyone would be chasing. After two years of unchallenged dominance in the 1952 and 53 World Championships, Scuderia Ferrari found themselves dethroned by the re-emerging Silver Arrows last season, managing to secure only two Grand Prix victories. Despite the apparent technological gap between the German machines and their own, chief designer Aurelio Lampredi took a bold stance, opting to modernize existing designs rather than start from scratch. The fruit of his labor was the Ferrari 555, an evolution of the previous 553 model. This new iteration boasted a more flattened, streamlined body, earning it the nickname Super Shark, and featured a slightly redesigned front suspension for improved handling. However, the team's driver lineup leaves much to be desired. With the departures of Jose Froilan Gonzalez and Mike Hawthorne for various reasons, the roster now consists of just two main drivers. Veteran Italian Nino Farina, who is returning from a serious accident sustained last year, and Frenchman Maurice Trintignant, who is yet to showcase any particularly remarkable speed. The 1954 season proved to be a tumultuous chapter for Maserati, a team that initially appeared to be on the rise. After securing consecutive victories in Argentina and Belgium, their fortunes took a dramatic turn when they lost their star driver, Juan Manuel Fanjo, alongside chief designer Joaquino Colombo. The departure marked the beginning of a rough patch filled with technical woes, and a tragic turn of events with the untimely death of their new leader, Onofre Marimon. As a result, Maserati finished the championship in third place, trailing behind both Daimler-Benz and Ferrari. Despite these setbacks, the Maserati 250F cars showcased remarkable speed and balance. 
Under the guidance of new chief designer Giulio Alfieri, significant improvements were made to the 250Fs. Innovations such as a new five-speed gearbox, a SU fuel injection system, and Dunlop disc brakes were introduced, enhancing the car's performance and reliability. Last season marked the inaugural participation of the Turin team in the World Championship. However, due to delays in preparing their new Lancia D50 cars, their debut was postponed multiple times, ultimately occurring only at the final stage of the championship in Spain. When they finally took to the track, the innovative cars designed by Vittorio Giano immediately showcased their impressive speed capabilities, allowing the talented Alberto Ascari to clinch pole position on his very first attempt. This season, Gianni Lancia's team is set to compete in a full championship, and with Ascari's stellar performance in Spain still fresh in everyone's minds, he is poised to emerge as a serious contender against the dominant Silver Arrows in the battle for the title. The race weekend in Buenos Aires was sweltering, with temperatures reaching 37 degrees Celsius in the shade and asphalt temperatures soaring to around 50 degrees Celsius. This extreme heat posed a significant challenge, not just for the cars, but for the drivers as well. Back then, there were no drink bottles in the cockpits, which meant that drivers had to hydrate extensively before the race and make pit stops during the event to replenish their fluids and avoid dehydration. While many drivers gulped down considerable amounts of water before the race, Juan Manuel Fanjo opted for a different strategy. In preparation for the grueling conditions, he trained himself to manage on minimal fluids each day. This camel tactic proved to be advantageous for him during the race. From the very start of the qualifying, the Lancia and Ferrari drivers set a blistering pace. Scuderia Ferrari's guest driver, Jose Froilan Gonzalez, claimed the spotlight by clocking an impressive 1 minute 43.1. Alberto Ascari, driving for Lancia, followed closely behind, finishing just half a second off Gonzalez's time. Juan Manuel Fanjo, who had kept a low profile throughout much of the session, managed to match Ascari's time in the final minutes, showing his remarkable ability to perform under pressure. Maserati's newcomer, Jean Berra, demonstrated his potential by securing fourth place in his competitive debut, trailing the two world champions by a mere two-tenths. Meanwhile, Fanjo's teammate, Carl Kling, encountered engine problems with his main car, but even while driving a spare, he secured the sixth fastest time, finishing exactly one second behind Gonzalez's pole position. The race spanned 96 grueling laps, covering a total distance of 375 kilometers in the scorching heat, a Grand Prix infamous for the extreme toll it took on both drivers and their machines. Fanjo executed a flawless start, surging ahead to take the early lead. Behind him, Gonzalez and Ascari engaged in an intense side-by-side -side battle for second as they approached the first corner but it was the Italian who managed to edge ahead. But their duel was soon disrupted by Sterling Moss, who had made an astonishing start from eighth on the grid. Displaying remarkable skill, the Englishman quickly caught up to the front runners, and by the end of the first lap, overtook Gonzalez to claim third place, putting himself firmly in the hunt. Having been closely shadowing Fanjo since the start, Ascari seizes his moment. The two champions are wheel to wheel, but Ascari's daring maneuver pays off and he surges ahead, claiming the lead. Jean Berra tries to overtake Kling, but loses control, spinning across the track. Hermann takes full advantage, slipping past Kling to gain sixth position. Gonzalez launches a decisive attack, overtaking both Fanjo and Moss in a single lap to claim second place. However, Moss quickly reacts, capitalizing on the situation. As Gonzalez slips past Fanjo, Moss follows suit, overtaking the reigning champion and moving up to third. Kling misjudges a corner and veers off the track, his car hurtling toward the spectators gathered behind the fence. Fortunately, the barrier holds firm, absorbing the impact. Kling, 
shaken but unharmed, climbs out of the wreckage and walks back to the pits on foot. On lap four, Fanjo launches a counter-attack on Moss. With precise timing, he outmaneuvers the young Englishman and retakes third spot, once again asserting his dominance in the race. But Fanjo keeps up the pressure, refusing to settle. With a bold move, he overtakes Gonzalez, reclaiming second place. On lap six, after relentlessly chasing Herman for several laps, Harry Shell finally finds his moment. With a well-timed move, the American slips past Herman and secures fifth place. Eugenio Castellotti loses control and skids off the track. Although he manages to rejoin the race, the mishap costs him dearly, dropping him to the very back of the field. Lap 7 sees a dramatic shift in the lead. José Froilán González makes two bold overtakes in quick succession. First, he gets past Fanjo and then quickly sets his sights on Ascari. With a masterful move, González surges ahead of the Italian, taking control of the race and becoming the new leader. But Ascari retaliates against González, executing a well-timed maneuver to regain the lead. The crowd roars as the tension mounts in this intense battle for the top spot. However, Castellotti's race takes another turn as he flies off the track once more, losing control of his Lancia D50. This unfortunate mishap causes him to miss both Iglesias and Berra, dropping him to the very back of the field yet again. As the race progresses into lap 14, the sweltering heat begins to take a significant toll on the driver's endurance. Juan Manuel Fanjo, who has been closely tailing Gonzalez, starts to feel the effects and slows his pace slightly. Fanjo's decision to ease off could be strategic, allowing him to conserve energy for a stronger push later in the race. In stark contrast to Fanjo's measured pace, Castellotti finds himself struggling to cope with the extreme heat. He is on the verge of losing consciousness and his speed drops dramatically as fatigue overwhelms him. With great effort, Castellotti manages to reach the pits, where his team quickly assesses the situation. Understanding the urgency, they make the decision to replace him. Villaresi takes over the cockpit, rejoining the race, but he finds himself at the back of the pack. Nino Farina, enduring excruciating pain from the burns he sustained in last year's accident, finds the heat of the cockpit unbearable. Despite his determination to push through, the agony becomes too much, and he makes the difficult decision to pit early. As he pulls into the pits, his team rushes to assist him, administering a morphine injection to alleviate his suffering. Disaster strikes on lap 22, as Alberto Ascari loses control and flies off the track crashing his car in a dramatic turn of events. The reigning world champion's misfortune opens the door for José Froilán González, who seizes the opportunity to take the lead. But four laps later, González heads to the pits as well. Despite his impressive lead, the Argentine driver, still recovering from a serious back injury sustained last season, is unable to endure the pain any longer. He exits the car, signaling the end of his race and immediately receives a dose of morphine to alleviate his discomfort. Meanwhile, Farina, after receiving a morphine injection, boldly climbs into Gonzalez's Ferrari and re-enters the race right in front of Hermann. This decision is shocking as it exemplifies the reckless nature of Formula One in the 1950s, where safety was a mere afterthought. Fortunately, Hermann, already exhausted from the sweltering heat, makes no attempt to overtake Farina. Sterling Moss, who had been holding a strong second place, suddenly finds himself in trouble as fuel supply issues cause his silver arrow to lose power. Frustrated, he pulls the car over to the side of the road, ending his promising run in the race. Juan Manuel Fanjo suddenly pulls into the pits, signaling a troubling issue with his Mercedes. The mechanics quickly diagnose the problem. One of the fuel pumps has failed. When he finally returns to the track, he slots back in fourth place. Meanwhile, Harry Shell seizes the opportunity and emerges as the new leader of the race. 
Most of last season, Harry Shell competed as a private racer behind the wheel of his own Maserati, but unfortunately, he did not manage to secure any significant results. However, with the arrival of the new Maserati 250F, the American driver quickly demonstrated impressive speed and emerged as one of the main contenders for victory in the Spanish Grand Prix. This standout performance captured the attention of Maserati's management, and as a result, Harry Shell has been offered a contract as one of the factory drivers for this season. Now armed with a competitive car and the backing of the prestigious Italian team, Shell has a golden opportunity to prove himself on the world stage and make a name for himself among the elite drivers of Formula One. The upcoming season holds great promise and fans will be eager to see how he fares against the formidable competition. Trintignant's car begins to lose power dramatically and the engine's troubling sounds signal a serious issue. Recognizing that he can't continue, Trintignant reluctantly drives into the pits. On lap 38, Farina also drive into the pits. The Italian is swiftly given another morphine injection to alleviate his suffering. Maurice Trintignant seizes the opportunity, hopping into the car. Herman struggles to maintain control of his car, driving in a semi-conscious state as the heat and exhaustion take their toll. Trintignant, now in a better condition after his earlier pit stop, effortlessly passes the faltering German. The race leader, Shell, can no longer withstand the grueling conditions and pulls into the pits. Exhausted and unable to continue, he hands control of the car over to Berra. But Mieres, after leading for just one lap, also makes a pit stop. However, with no one available to replace the Argentinian in the Maserati team, he quickly quenches his thirst and returns to the track in third place. On lap 45, Fanjo finds his rhythm and picks up the pace, clocking the fastest lap of the race with a time of 148.3. Although it's impressive, it's still over five seconds slower than the pole position time. Trintignant pulls into the pits, unable to keep pace with the front runners. In a strategic move, he hands over the car to a refreshed Gonzalez. On lap 53, Miras encounters fuel pump issues with his Maserati, forcing him to head into the pits for repairs. The mechanics scramble to address the problem, but the repair takes an agonizing 10 minutes, significantly hampering his race. When he finally returns to the track, Miras finds himself in seventh place. Gonzalez steadily closes the gap to Berra, who is battling to maintain his position against the charging Ferrari. In a tense moment, Berra overdrives while attempting to fend off the Argentine, losing control and spinning off the track. But Gonzalez loses focus and misjudges a corner careening off the track. Frustrated with the relentless heat and the challenges of the race, Gonzalez decides to pull into the pits, allowing Farina to take over the Ferrari. As the grueling heat continues to take its toll, Kling struggles to maintain his focus, feeling overwhelmed by the sweltering temperatures and the exhaust fumes infiltrating the cockpit. Recognizing he can no longer continue, he makes the wise decision to pit. In a swift exchange, he hands the reins of his Mercedes over to Moss, who re-enters the race without losing his position, still in fourth place. Trintignant pulls into the pits. He has pushed himself to the absolute limit. Recognizing he can no longer continue, he hands over the controls to Maioli. Moss discovers that the brake pedal on his Mercedes is coated in oil, severely affecting his braking performance. Struggling to maintain pace, Moss is unable to fend off Umberto Maioli, who swiftly closes the gap and overtakes him with ease. On the final lap of a grueling race, Juan Manuel Fanjo crosses the finish line clinching one of the most remarkable victories in motorsport history after three hours of relentless driving in punishing conditions. The conclusion of the race yielded one of the most absurd results in Formula One history, largely due to the allowance of shared cars. Gonzalez, Farina and Trintignant all crossed the finish line in second place, each sharing the six points awarded for that position. However, in a bizarre twist, 
both Farina and Trintignant also secured third place, allowing them to claim an additional four points as well. In total, an astonishing nine drivers received points in a race where only five should have been awarded. To top it off, Roberto Mieres, who finished fifth, somehow ended up with more points than five drivers ahead of him. What a complete disaster. After the race, Fanjo said, The cabin of my car was a solid fire. Everything burned, even the steering wheel. At certain points, the temperature rose to 120 degrees. I could barely catch my breath until half the race was over. Never, never, never will I forget this race. In the aftermath of the Grand Prix, Juan Manuel Fanjo's doctor revealed, due to prolonged exposure to the scorching heat inside the cockpit, Fanjo suffered second-degree burns on his legs, an injury that would take three long months to heal. The 1955 Argentine Grand Prix epitomized the madness of 1950s Formula One, where drivers pushed themselves to the absolute limit. The era was characterized by a shocking lack of safety and support, with some drivers resorting to morphine injections to manage pain and fatigue, merely to stay competitive for their teams. A wild, chaotic landscape where sheer willpower and raw talent reigned supreme. 